Aquarius Lecture 2020 mit Frau Professorin Fonke. 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 Brian aus Danke. Dublin. We are very happy to have you here. Welcome. Warmly okay. here. Das Wetter ist schlecht, die öffentlichen Verkehrsmittel sind zusammengebrochen, höre ich. Schön, dass Sie es hierher geschafft haben. Im Namen des Institutum Philosophicum über die Pontanum und des Instituts für christliche Philosophie mit speziellem Gruß auch des Leiters des Innsbruck Center for Philosophy for Religion, des anwesenden Herrn Professor Jäger, heiße ich Sie ganz herzlich willkommen. Kommen heute. Es freut mich besonders unter uns zu haben, den, der immer dabei ist, Altrektor Professor Bata Otomuk, schön, dass du hier da bist. Ah, liebe Gäste, Kolleginnen und Kollegen unserer Fakultät, Last but not least auch Studierende und Absolventinnen und Absolventen, die mit ihrem Dasein die Verbundenheit mit uns zum Ausdruck bringen. Schön, dass Sie da sind. Aquinas Lecture. Lassen Sie mich auch kurz auf, das Finis, auf den Finis Proximus unserer Veranstaltung zu sprechen kommen. Was tun wir hier eigentlich? Warum organisieren wir diese Veranstaltung alljährlich? Wir wollen die Arbeit unseres Instituts und darauf supervenierend nach Rundgang 1996, 1931 folgende, ja, darauf supervenierend auch die Arbeit des Innsbruck Center for Philosophy of Religion, fokussiert der Öffentlichkeit an Fakultät, Universität, aber auch Kirche darstellen. Ein Brennglas zur Fokussierung ist immer Thema und auch Person der Festnäherin. Heute eben Professor äh, Ryan, der kann äh, Josef Wittra wird sie ausführlich einführen, nur hier. Äh, hohe Kenntnis in der Tradition. Thomas von Aquin und Augustinus, Sensibilität für Gender Mainstreaming und mit Blick auf gesellschaftliche Relevanz. Das ist Thema und auch Ausrichtung dessen, was wir hier tun. Brennglas dieser Fokussierung ist aber auch der eben erschienene und hiermit zu präsentierende Ratio Fidei Amica 2019 Jahresberichts in dem Leben, auch die Sorgen und die wissenschaftliche Arbeit unseres Instituts dargestellt sind. Ich möchte mich an dieser Stelle insbesondere bei Monika Tatter bedanken für die Redaktion, die Herausgabe sogar und alle Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die hier ihren Beitrag geleistet haben. Schauen Sie hinein in den Bericht, der liegt auf, umsonst, dennoch kostenlos, ja, nicht umsonst und dennoch kostenlos, wir werden einiges zum Nachlesen finden, 100 Jahre Pater Koret, äh, Gäste, Publikationen, einfach in Zusammenfassung bis hinein in die Nachwuchsförderung unseres Instituts. Was bleibt mir? Es bleibt mir einen schönen Abend Ihnen allen zu wünschen mit dem Vortrag und danach beim Wienum Akademikum, das die Xenia Schale äh, dankenswerterweise so gut organisiert hat. Damit darf ich auch das Wort übergeben an Dekan Josef Witterer. Dankeschön. Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to uh, present today our speaker of the Aquinas Lecture, Professor Fonche Ryan. She is current director of the Loyola Institute at the prestigious Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, recently she has also been appointed as distinguished fellow of the Trinity College. Professor Ryan is a leading theologian, not a philosopher in the proper sense, but a theologian with expertise in the thought 
thinking of Thomas Aquinas. She is showing the relevance of this work to contemporary debates in ecclesiology, especially with regards to church leadership. Her contribution for theology cannot be evaluated high enough. In the last, in the last 30 years, there has been a new interpretation and understanding of the text of Thomas Aquinas, mainly in the field of analytic philosophy. Names like Kenny, Passnow, Stump, and others are mentioned. In the area of theology, however, that is my view, you can correct me, a very biased reading prevailed. Most contemporary theologians either disregard Aquinas completely or they misinterpret him by a selective reading. Fanche Ryan brings through her publications a much more differentiated perspective. Looking at questions on leadership, priesthood, authority, with an approach which is faithful to Aquinas' work, but also critical of patriarchal prejudices. For example, in her article, Thomas Aquinas and the Priesthood of All Believers, she argues that Aquinas is closer to Vaticanum II than most contemporary theologians would admit. In her book chapter, Darwin and Aquinas, she again presents a radically new approach concerning the relationship between the classical Thomistic philosophy and Darwin's evolutionary approach. Contrary to a widespread opinion, von Ryan demonstrates that Aquinas' view is, especially when it comes to secondary causes, closer to Darwin's evolutionary worldview than Darwin's own contemporaries. The current research of Fanchet Ryan is also an excellent example how she is able to connect rigorous research <coughs> on one of the most important theolog theologians and philosophers of the Middle Ages with a successful analysis of pivotal social and political issues. Her current project is focused on Aquinas' truth-telling and its relevance to an account of human flourishing. Through her extensive analysis of Aquinas' text, she demonstrates that the virtue of truth-telling is an integral component within the complex virtue of justice. In her project, she shows in the light of Aquinas' argument that the decay of truth-telling is thereby a decay of, of justice. The argument is that where truth-telling decays, society decays. Aquinas' linking of the activity of truth-telling with justice and with hope brings an original and significant contribution to the contemporary debates in academy, church, and society. Beside her excellent performance in the research of Aquinas, Van Ryan is also a leading figure in the field of European theology. She is actually coordinating an, initi an initiative of several European theological faculties concerning the status of theology in public universities. Her expertise in Aquinas' work and her ability to bring her insights of the analysis of medieval texts in a creative dialogue with contemporary discussions in theology also informs her newly edited chapter currently at press with Notre Dame University Press with the title On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine. So, I'm very glad today to announce your, 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 uh, the, the title of your paper you give us today. Uh, and I'm very glad that you accepted our invitation to Innsbruck despite these 
unconvenient weather conditions and, and so on. Um, I'm very glad that you uh, speak to us about the topic, the complexity of truth-telling Augustine, Aquinas and contemporary considerations. So, danke, Joseph, and good Abend. And now I will have to speak in English, I'm afraid. But hopefully I will speak slowly enough so that people can understand. So thank you very much for the wonderful welcome this evening. So the complexity of truth-telling. This paper will argue for the contemporary relevance of Aquinas' treatment of veracitas, truth-telling, and in particular will point towards a relevance to the contemporary discussion of fake news and post-truth. In Aquinas' treatment of the topic, veracitas, truth-telling, is presented, as Joseph has mentioned, as an annexed virtue to the virtue of justice, a virtue central to political and social well-being. In 1951, in The Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt observed that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exist. In a later work, she notes that, seen from the viewpoint of politics, truth has a despotic character. It is therefore hated by tyrants who rightly fear the competition of a coercive force they cannot monopolize. And it enjoys a rather precarious status in the eyes of governments that rest on consent and abhor coercion. Arendt was, I suggest, extraordinarily prescient in these remarks. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionary selected the term post-truth as word of the year. In 2017, a post-truth research excellence initiative was established by the University of Sydney. Its aim? To advise on how the truth might survive in this climate. These developments seem to be indicative of current social phenomenon. The media and politicians, ut in pluribus, seem to accept that we live in what many are terming a post-truth era. In a post-truth era, it doesn't seem to matter all that much whether one tells the truth or not. Working with this mindset, the decision to tell the truth or to work with alternative facts depends on the outcome that one seeks. Language is instrumentalized, that is, it is a tool to be used to achieve one's aims, a means to an end, and not in itself a human good. In this post-truth society, the activity of truth-telling is of little or no intrinsic value. And this is the context in which I turn in this paper to Thomas Aquinas' treatment of the virtue of veracitas, truth-telling. Aquinas addresses the concept of truth in many places. John F. Weipel suggests or provides a clear and insightful guide through the most important texts. Firstly, the scriptum super liber sensiarum, in the first part of the sentences, distinguish 19, question 5. Secondly, the well-known and much-studied treatise, Questio Disputate de Veritate, particularly question 1. Then, the Summa Contra Gentiles, part 1, chapter 60, and the discussion of truth in the Summa Theologia, prima pars, question 16, and truth-telling, veracitas, in the Secunda Secundae, question 109. Aquinas' foundational assertion is, God is truth. And this he expounds in the Summa Theologia in the Prima Pars, question 16. In this question, his concern is with what is truth? 
How do we truly know? And how our knowledge of truth differs from God's truth? What is said there in question 16 undergirds the teaching in the discussion of truth-telling in question 109 of the Secunda Secundae, the particular focus of this paper, question 109. Aquinas' theory of truth is thus metaphysical before being epistemological or psychological. In question 109, we are instructed that truth-telling is a virtue. Prior to this, in the prima pars, question 56, Aquinas has established that virtue is, and I quote, that which makes its possessor good and renders their action good. That's the Prima Secunde, question 56, article 3. There are two other important points emphasised in this earlier foundational question. Firstly, sic virtute recte viviter. It is by virtue that we live rightly. And secondly, virtue is directed towards the excellence of the producer. Aquinas will deploy these insights again in question 109 of the Secunda Secunda. As always, the context of a question in the Summa is significant. In the Secunda Pars, this question on truth-telling, question 109, is embedded within an overarching discussion of the seven virtues that make for human flourishing. The three theological virtues, faith, hope and love, caritas, and the four cardinal virtues, prudence, prudentia, justice, temperance and fortitude. And most significantly, this question on truth-telling is addressed in the midst of a discussion on the virtue of justice. Question 109 of the Secunda Secunde treats of the question of truth-telling under four articles, and we'll go through them now. In the first article, Aquinas asks whether truth-telling is a virtue, and then whether it is an intellectual, a moral, or a theological virtue. In the second article, he asks in what way truth-telling is a special virtue, utrum sit virtus specialis, that is, whether there is a specific aspect of human perfection of human flourishing achieved by the exercise of this virtue. The third article then is concerned with the relation between the virtue of truth-telling and the virtue of justice. He wonders, utrum sit pars justitia. And the fourth and final article asks if there is a need to consider the concepts of more and of less when it comes to truth-telling. All four articles are engaged with spelling out the full significance of understanding truth-telling as a virtue. In the first article of question 109, Secunda Secunde, Aquinas is clear. When it comes to a consideration of truth as truth-telling, the concept of virtue is key. The activity of truth-telling is an activity of virtue. He writes, truth may stand for that by which a person says what is true, in which sense one is said to be truthful. This truth or truthfulness must needs be a virtue, because to say what is true is a good act, and virtue is that which makes its possessor good and renders their action good. That's question 109, article 1, corpus. In the same article, Aquinas identifies truth-telling as neither a theological nor an intellectual, but a moral virtue. To have this virtue, he says, is to desire to tell the truth, to have a stable disposition to tell the truth, what one might call a settled orientation towards truth-telling. This action of truth-telling is an expression of what this person wants and who this person is. 
It is, we might say, in them to do this. The person desires to tell the truth. And this is why it is described as a moral virtue. It is a virtue of the will, an appetite of virtue. But this is not to exclude an intellectual dimension to truth-telling. And this is very important. For since Aquinas wrote his early commentary on the sentences, there has been a development in his thinking. When Aquinas wrote the Secunda Secunde, he had just completed his commentary on Aristotle's De Anima. This work had led him to see that when we come to the field of human action, there is no operation of the reason which is not also an operation of the will and vice versa. For there is an interweaving of understanding and being attracted that cannot be unraveled in practice. We think of what we are attracted to thinking of and we are attracted to what we think of. And frequently Aquinas asks, is intending or deciding or whatever an act of intellect or an act of will? And he usually answers both, but one predominantly. Truth-telling is best understood in this way, an interweaving of understanding, intellect, and being attracted will. It is in this context that Aquinas describes truth-telling as a moral virtue. So truth-telling is to be understood as an activity of virtue, primarily moral virtue, but with intellectual dimensions. As an activity of virtue, it is perfective of the person telling the truth. And Aquinas comments that, and I quote, when we find a special aspect of goodness in human acts, it is necessary that a person be disposed thereto by a special virtue. And in truth-telling, persons will be perfected by the virtue of truth. Article 2 Corpus, hoc perficitur homo per virtutum veritatis. The perfection of the intellect is achieved in truth-telling. In the exercise of the virtue of truth-telling, the person telling the truth over time develops a facility, a freedom, a capacity for doing this good thing. They grow into that particular perfection. It becomes part of their character. The virtue of truth-telling becomes constitutive of who they are. One might say they become people who tell the truth naturally, habitually, virtuously. As Aquinas says, an excellence comes to be within the person who has developed the virtue of truth-telling. However, it is important to observe that this doesn't mean that for these people it is necessarily easy to know the truthful thing to say or the truthful thing to do in all situations. Herbert McCabe, a close reader of Aquinas, is insightful. Herbert writes, we ought, of course, to be clear that acting from the inclination arising from virtue does not mean taking the easiest or least painful path. It means taking the one that conforms to and springs from who you are and what you treat as ultimately satisfactory. To act from the personality you have built for yourself, or which has been given to you by God's grace, or both, is to act in total freedom, to act from oneself." End of quote. In truth-telling, an order, a harmony, is maintained between what a person is saying is true and the fact of the matter. In the response to objection three of the second article, Aquinas makes this important point. The truth of life is the truth whereby a thing is true, not whereby a person says what is true. A person's life is said to be true from the fact that it attains its rule and measure. And for Aquinas, as a theologian, rectitude of life depends on conformity to the divine law. It is in this respect, in question 109 of the Secunda Secunde, that Aquinas says that a failure in truth-telling is a breach of our relationship with God. 
And so to Article 3 of Question 109, truth-telling and the virtue of justice. At this stage, it is of relevance to recall Aquinas' earlier argument in the Secunda Secunde, Question 80, Article 1, Corpus, where he observes that the virtue of truth can be seen as a next anecitur to justice as a kind of satellite virtue. One might say that justice, the truth-telling is a kind of necessary supplementary virtue within the broad realm of acting justly. It is to the virtue of justice as secondary to a principal virtue. Truth-telling has something in common with justice and yet it falls short of the complete definition of the virtue of justice. In Article 3 of Question 109, Aquinas develops this understanding. This positing of truth-telling as an activity of justice identifies its importance for human living and proper societal flourishing. His treatise on justice is one of the longest treatises in the Summa Theologia, occupying questions 57 to 122 of the Secunda Secundae. For Aquinas, the human concept of justice must be spoken of in the context of human experience and human living. For justice is essentially relational, ad altrum, towards the other, and brings about a certain equality between person and person. The English Dominican Victor White notes that justice, I quote, is concerned with the rightness and straightness of relations between human and human. It is not itself that rightness, but the practical establishment of that rightness. Its specific function is the giving to another of his use. Justitia est constans et perpetua voluntas jus sum uniquique tribuens. Justice is a stable and unfaltering willingness to render to each its due. Victor White notes that Aquinas follows St. Ambrose in his definition of justice. Justitia est quae sum quique tribuit. Justice is that which renders to each what is its, what belongs to it. And certain goods belong to a person by virtue of their being a person because of their created existence. These goods are owing to it debitum, and there is obligation debitum on the part of others to render these goods to them in the give and take which constitutes human society. Understood in this way, justice is the rendering of use, the rendering of justice to another person. Then significantly, truth-telling for Aquinas is the rendering of truth to the other person. Truth-telling is a social virtue. It sets up a certain equality between people. Truth-telling is essential to the formation of society. However, and importantly, it must be noted that for Aquinas, the virtue of truth-telling dispatches not a legal debt but a debt of what Aquinas terms honestas. Honestas demands that one reveal the truth about oneself, that one be truth-telling. The concept of honestas is complex, and the term doesn't easily render itself into English, or at least not into one simple word. A good translation might be proper respect, where proper refers to honesty and respect to honour. Honestas, one might say, is about being honourable in relationship. It is a matter of acting towards others with proper integrity. For Aquinas, truthfulness differs from justice, as truthfulness dispatches not a legal debt, but a debt of proper respect, of integrity. It is ex honestata, out of integrity, that one should be truth-telling. Following the teaching of Aquinas, 
It is the contention of Article 3 that we owe it to one another, that it is a matter of justice that we be truth-telling so that we can trust one another, for this is essential for the preservation of human society. In Aquinas's words, since the human is a social animal, one human naturally owes another whatever is necessary for the preservation of human society. Now it would be impossible for people to live together unless they believed one another as declaring the truth to one another. Hence, the virtue of truth does in a manner regard something as being due. I think we can see the relevance of this type of quote to today. The central activity of the virtue of truth-telling in this perspective is the truthful manifestation of oneself in society. For Aquinas, truthfulness, truth-telling, is effected both by words and by deeds. Both truthful acts and truthful deeds perfect us. Again, in Aquinas' words, it belongs to the virtue of truth to show oneself outwardly by outward signs to be such as one is. Now, outward signs are not only words, but also deeds. Accordingly, just as it is contrary to truth to signify by words something different from that what is in one's mind, so also it is contrary to truth to employ signs of deeds or things to signify the contrary of what is in oneself. A truthful person for Aquinas is thus one wherein words and deeds, exterior acts, are in agreement with a person's character. It is noteworthy that this statement on the virtue of truth is found in question 111, one of the four questions where Aquinas discusses the vice of mendacity. That's in the Secunda Secunda, question 110 to 113. For Aquinas, truth-telling and mendacity pertain not only to one's words, but also to one's actions. Aquinas has shown that truth-telling is a matter of personal authenticity. And mendacity then is its opposite, a false expression of one's character. This points towards what we have termed in the title of this paper, the complexity of truth-telling. In Article 4, the final article of the question, Aquinas asks whether truth-telling admits of more or less. He returns to the issue he had discussed in Article 1, where he says, to state that which concerns oneself, insofar as it is a statement of what is true, is good generically. However, to be virtuous in speaking the truth about oneself, Aquinas notes, the truth should be clothed with due circumstance. Said ad hoc requiritor quod ulterius debitus, circumstances vestiatur. The truth must be clothed with due circumstance. In this regard, in Article 4, he considers whether or not the boastful person and the understated person are being truthful. He argues that the boastful person is stating what is not the case, therefore declining from the truth. With the understated person, it is not quite the same. It is, he says, more repugnant to the truth to be boastful than to be understated. The understated person is indeed also declining from the truth, but less seriously for Aquinas. He writes, this would be less repugnant to the truth, not indeed as regards the proper aspect of truth, but as regards the aspects of prudence, prudentia, which should be safeguarded in all the virtues. Sed secundum rationum prudentia, coma portet salvare in omnibus virtutibus. This emphasis on prudential truth-telling is a most important consideration when it comes to the consideration of the complexity of truth-telling. And I hope we shall see that later, prudential truth-telling. 
So the argument thus far is that if one wishes to understand Aquinas on truth-telling, it is imperative to first understand his concept of virtue and of virtuous human living. Secondly, it is important to understand that his discussion of the virtue of truth-telling is in the context of the virtue of justice and the wider discussion of all the virtues. For truth-telling is not only an activity of justice, but also of prudence, prudentia, and of love, caritas. The importance of this will become evident in the later sections of this paper. So Aquinas online. The question arises, can Aquinas and his theory, some would say his theology of virtuous human living, ever conceive of situations where it is permissible to avoid telling the truth, perhaps even to lie. Can to lie or to circumvent truth-telling be in accord with justice and in accordance with the character one has built for oneself? It seems that while Aquinas does maintain the absolute prohibition against lying, following Augustine on this, Aquinas does make important observations when it comes to the complexity of truth-telling in real-life situations. In this regard, a careful recall of question 109 is helpful. To say what is true is a good act, Article 1 Corpus. In speaking the truth about oneself, the truth, as we've heard, should be clothed with due circumstance. And later, in the same article, he notes, on the part of the act to observe the mean is to tell the truth when one ought and as one ought. That's question 109, article 1, add 3. Aquinas' concern is not with one single act, but with a virtuous life, with veritas vita, vita vera, the truthful living, with attaining its rule and measure, and with the divine law. In living a truthful life, as we have seen, Aquinas identifies the virtue of prudentia as crucial. He returns to this point in the Secunda Secunda question 110 online, the question we shall now turn our attention to. Aquinas devotes four questions to the vices opposed to truth-telling. And one of these vices is the lie. He looks at this in question 110. The other three vices are pretense, simulatio, that's question 111, boasting, yoikansia, question 112, and self-deprecation, ironia, question 114. Focus is now primarily on the first of these vices, lying, as discussed in question 110. In the first article, Aquinas reminds us that although a moral virtue, the act of truth-telling is an act of reason. To lie is essentially to tell a falsehood with the intention to deceive. Then in the second article, Aquinas distinguishes between various kinds of lies. Here he identifies what he terms the officious lie understood as when one lies with the intention of helping another person or to save a person from being injured. The officious lie wherein something useful to the other person is intended is thus for Aquinas less grave a sin than other forms of lying. He writes, it is evident that the greater the good intended, the more is the sin of lying diminished in gravity. Article 3 is of particular interest. Here Aquinas considers if every lie is a sin. In the corpus of this article he states that every lie is a sin as also Augustine declares in Contramandatium. While this does indeed imply that Aquinas agrees with Augustine, Aquinas makes some important modifications. 
In Aquinas' in the reply to the objection four of Article Three, we read Aquinas saying, "Nevertheless, it is lawful to hide the truth prudently by keeping it back." And he says, as Augustine says in Contramandatium, but Augustine doesn't say that in Contramandatium. It is lawful to hide the to hide the truth fruitfully by keeping it back. And so we go to Jerome and Augustine, because in the background of Aquinas' struggle. To articulate the complexity of truth-telling lies Augustine's work. It's appropriate now to take a brief look at Augustine and his work on lying. Augustine has two short treatises on lying, De Mandatio and Contra Mandatio. This discussion in Augustine is clearly part of Aquinas' heritage. In the first of these works, De Mandatio, the background of Augustine's letters to Jerome, in particular letter 28, written about 394 or 395, is pertinent. We have an extended and often volatile correspondence between Augustine and Jerome on the question as to whether or not scripture can be said to lie or in any way to support the telling of falsehoods. And it's perhaps the most famous debate on truth telling and lying in the Christian tradition. Jerome, in his commentary on St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, interpreted Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, where St. Paul states that he opposed Peter to his face, rebuked him for withdrawing from the Gentiles when the Judaizers, the Jews who thought all should be circumcised, came to Antioch. And Jerome goes as follows. He says, the whole scene was planned. For Jerome, Peter's momentary concession to the Judaizers and Paul's public upbraiding of Peter were pious theatre. And Paul wrote of them as if they were actual fact for a strategic purpose, to create an occasion for the preaching of the gospel. The whole story for Jerome was a technique for teaching the Judaizers that the Mosaic law and its observances were now abrogated. This, for Jerome, was an example of tactical fiction of the sort permitted to orators. And in coming to this interpretation, Jerome informs us that he has used many sources, several Greek commentaries, in particular Origen. Jerome doesn't present Paul as a liar, but as someone trained in the school of rhetoric who was utilizing fictive events to convey his message. With great respect for Jerome, Augustine disagrees. For, he said, if we are to follow Jerome's interpretation, the entire scriptures are then undermined. For to admit that Paul had lied would mean that we could interpret scripture however we wanted. Augustine responds robustly in a series of letters over a number of years because he fears Jerome's influence and warns that when an interpreter of scripture, in this case Jerome, and I quote from Augustine, pronounces anything to be untrue, he demands that he be believed in preference and endeavours to shake our confidence in the authority of the divine scripture. The discussion between the two went on for years, with letters being lost and tempers at times frayed. Augustine could not accept Jerome's interpretation of Galatians 2 and wanted him to retract his interpretation. For Augustine, it is no question at all whether it is acceptable for scripture to contain a lie. A falsehood cannot be used to seek to calm any controversy. Augustine wanted Jerome to amend his work and to formally retract his interpretation. Jerome's defense of falsehood brought great sorrow to Augustine, which of course returns us to the primary challenge, the frightful notion that Jerome, for Augustine, undertook the defense of a lie such that, for Augustine, the authority of the divine scriptures is crumbling. 
It is important to remember that in this, the first letter of the controversy, Augustine's primary concern is with the authority, the truth of Holy Scripture. He writes, it is one question whether it may be at any time the duty of a good person to deceive, but it is another question whether it can have been the duty of a writer of Holy Scripture to deceive. Nay, it is not another question. It is no question at all. End of quote. This heated discussion must always be kept in the background as one reads Augustine's treatises online. Aquinas, inheriting this tradition, on the one hand acknowledges with Augustine the illegitimacy of lying, but on the other hand Aquinas allows and even advocates the prudential use of truth-telling. This advocacy of prudential truth-telling is a useful avenue to a discussion of contemporary accounts of the complexity of truth-telling. The work of two more recent thinkers, both writing in the context of the Second World War, the German Lutheran minister and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the English Cambridge philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe offer, I suggest, significant reflections around the complexity of truth-telling in real-life situations. <coughs> Excuse me. So first, to what I've termed Dietrich Bonhoeffer's problematic. Bonhoeffer wrote in his in History and Good in Ethics, <clears throat> from the principle of truthfulness, Kant draws the grotesque conclusion that I must even return an honest yes to the inquiry of the murderer who breaks into my house and asks whether my friend whom he is pursuing has taken refuge there. In such a case of self-righteousness of conscience has become outrageous presumption and blocks the path of responsible action. Responsibility is the total and realistic response of a person to the claim of God and of our neighbour. But this example shows in its true light how the response of a conscience which is bound by principles is only a partial one. If I refuse to incur guilt against the principle of truthfulness for the sake of my friend, if I refuse to tell a robust lie for the sake of my friend, for it is only the self-righteously law-abiding conscience which will pretend that, in fact, no lie is involved. If, in other words, I refuse to bear guilt for charity's sake, then my action is in contradiction to my responsibility, which has its foundation in reality. Here again, it is precisely in the responsible acceptance of guilt that a conscience which is bound solely to Christ will best prove its innocence. These words of Bonhoeffer were written between 1940 and 43, while at the monastery of Etel and then at Kika. The political situation in which he is living made clear to him the complexity of truth-telling. Bonhoeffer seems to be engaging with a passage from Kant's essay on a supposed right to lie from altruistic motives. In this essay, Kant refutes the idea that one might tell a falsehood to protect another, for it is never permissible to avoid telling the literal truth. Truthfulness, he writes, is a duty which must be regarded as the ground of all duties, a sacred and absolutely commanding decree of reason limited by no expediency. That one person's truth-telling may, or indeed will, result in the unjust harming of another does not seem to carry weight. The principle is the important thing. That's how Bonhoeffer is interpreting Kant. In Nazi Germany, Bonhoeffer is rejecting this view. Because for him, to betray a friend to a murderer, in either the name of Christian conscience or in the name of a generic principle is a grotesque misunderstanding of why one should tell the truth. Christians are not called to be truth-telling 
out of loyalty to abstract principles or to keep our consciences pure for Bonhoeffer. Our Christian responsibility, our moral responsibility, is the freedom which is gifted to us only in the obligation to God and to our neighbour. This for Bonhoeffer is the context in which any understanding of truth-telling must be situated. In an unfinished essay, perhaps his last, Bonhoeffer again addresses this issue of truth-telling with increased insight. The title of this essay is, in English, What is meant by telling the truth? The context of composition is important. For Bonhoeffer's constant claim is that what it means to tell the truth, to be a truth bearer, is inseparable from consideration of the concrete situation in which issues of truth and falsehood arise. His is a time of violence, Nazi Germany. He is in prison in Berlin. During the early days of his imprisonment, he was interrogated regularly by the military judge Manfred Ruder. This is the world in which Bonhoeffer was challenged to think more deeply on his belief that yes, truth matters, while at once seeking to conceal the facts with regard to the planned assassination of Hitler. It was his belief that the plan and the conspirators, those involved, needed to be protected. His concern then was thus less with giving us a theory of truth, rather he sought to give an account of what it means to be truthful. Bonhoeffer begins his consideration of what it means to tell the truth by noting that from once we learn to speak, we are taught that we must tell the truth. And he wonders what this means. What does it mean to tell the truth? And no less importantly, what does it demand of us? For Bonhoeffer, these questions are addressed in real life scenarios. He's considering what precisely does being a truth-telling person demand of a person? What does it demand of a society? In developing an account of what it means to be truthful, in his essay, Monhofer first addresses the relationship between a parent and a child. In this context, he notes that, and I quote, the truthfulness of a child towards his parents is essentially different from that of the parents towards their child, end of quote. While children are obliged, so we are taught, to speak the truth to their parents, parents are not obliged in the same way to divulge everything to their children. Children, one might say, have no right to certain truths about their parents. In this case, we can say that relationship can dictate what we might term the entitlement of a person to a level of truthful speech from another. Context matters for Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer's distinction between the different roles parents and teachers have in speaking to a child illustrate well the complexity of what it means to be truthful. The right to speak and the manner of speaking are determined by the particular office I hold in a relationship. Words live in particular places, in particular environments. And when a word is wrenched inappropriately from one place to another, the border between private life and public life for Bonhoeffer is transgressed. Devastating consequences can follow. For words have a context. Telling the truth is an exercise with boundaries. One concrete example Bonhoeffer gives is of a child being asked publicly in the classroom if his father comes home drunk at night. While yes, this is the case, the child denies this to the teacher. In this situation, Bonhoeffer rules that the teacher is wrong. This question should not have been asked in this way of a child who has not yet worked out 
how to answer this question in such a way as to protect the family and at once satisfy the rule of the school. Indeed, the child has told a lie, but this lie contains truth, as the child's action serves and seeks to preserve the institution of the family and protect his father's weakness. While formally untrue, Bonhoeffer urges us to resist judging the child's action as telling a lie. It is, he suggests, difficult to say what actually constitutes a lie in this context. Another example in the same line of thought is given by Jan Bechter Elstein in his essay Bonhoeffer on Modernity, Sick et Non. The example is that of a child reporting to the state police that a parent has spoken badly about Adolf Hitler. The child may indeed be reporting accurately, but the result is that now a parent is incarcerated in a concentration camp. How are we to assess the child's action? Was it an act of truth-telling or a lie, a betrayal? Elstein, following Bonhoeffer's line of reasoning, suggests that the action of the child was a despicable lie, and I quote, because it wrenched words from one order of reality in which human beings are embedded and unleashed them in another order of the real, in this case in a perverted order of the real, since God's mandate of governance had been twisted by the Nazis and turned into something demonic. Examples such as these led Bonhoeffer to ask if the necessary deception of an enemy in war is a lie. Kant, he notes, declared he was too proud ever to utter a falsehood, carrying, according to Bonhoeffer, this principle ad absurdum by saying that he would feel himself obliged to give truthful information even to a criminal looking for a friend of his who had concealed himself in his house. Bonhoeffer judges a robust lie in defense of a friend as being more akin to a living truth. He wrestles with this complex question of truth-telling. His argument is that we are not bound to tell the truth to everyone in all situations. Au contraire, to do so may be an act of aggression unleashed in guise as a virtue. We have a responsibility to think about the situation, about relation, about where I stand, where she stands, what entitles me to speak. Telling the truth must be learnt. It calls upon one to read the situation one is in. In his same essay, What is Meant by Telling the Truth, he writes, Telling the truth is therefore something which must be learnt. This will sound very shocking to anyone who thinks that it must all depend on moral character, and that if this is blameless, the rest is child's play. But the simple fact is that the ethical cannot be detached from reality, and consequently, continuous progress in learning to appreciate reality is a necessary ingredient in ethical action. In the question with which we are now concerned, action consists of speaking. The real is to be expressed in words. That is what constitutes truthful speech. And this inevitably raises the question of the how of these words. It is a question of knowing the right word on each occasion. Finding this word is a matter of long, earnest, and ever more advanced effort on the basis of experience and knowledge of the real. Thus wrote Monhofer, telling the truth is something to be learned. The ethical for him cannot be divorced from reality, from context. The reality of a relationship impacts on the activity of truth-telling. Parent-child, child-teacher, or in his case, interrogator and prisoner. Somewhat enigmatically he declares, if my utterance is to be truthful, it must in each case be different according to whom I am addressing, who is questioning me, and what I am speaking about. The truthful world is not in itself constant. It is as much alive as life itself. For Bonhoeffer, to tell his captors the truth 
about the conspiracy to kill Hitler, while it might accord to the principle of truth-telling, it cannot be judged to be really concretely truthful. A truthfulness which is not concrete for him is not truthful before God. Bonhoeffer's understanding of truth-telling is challenging and complex. And I repeat, the truthful word is not in itself constant. It is as much alive as life itself. If it is detached from life and from its relevance to the concrete other person, if the truth is told without taking into account to whom it is addressed, then this truth has only the appearance of truth, but it lacks its essential character. And so, briefly, to Elizabeth Anscombe. This same question about the essential character of truth-telling, though with some interesting differences, is addressed by the Cambridge philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, one of the most brilliant philosophers, I suggest, of the 20th century. <laughs> Anscombe is renowned for her essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, which is deemed to mark the foundation of the re-emergence of debate on virtue ethics, and her book, Intention, which philosopher Donald Davidson describes as the most important treatment of action since Aristotle. Modern moral philosophy offers a scathing critique of moral philosophy since the Enlightenment. It argued for the development of virtue ethics as an alternative to Kantian ethics, to social contract ethical theory, and to utilitarianism. Anscombe, having reviewed much of the work of recent moral philosophers, argued in modern moral philosophy that there is a huge gap, at present unfillable as far as we are concerned, which needs to be filled by an account of human nature, human action, the type of characteristic a virtue is, and above all, of human flourishing. As we have seen in the work of Bonhoeffer, borderline cases, the complex situations which arise in human life offer the most critical test for any ethical theory. The challenge is to know what is reasonable, to know what is the right practical action, prudentia, to take when we encounter boundary areas. The consequentialist theory for Anscombe will consider the outcomes, the consequences of this or that action, and not the intrinsic badness, or indeed intrinsic goodness, or so she argues. She writes, Now, if you are either an Aristotelian or a believer in divine law, you will deal with a borderline case by considering whether doing such and such in such and such circumstances is, say, murder or an act of injustice. And according as you decide it is or it isn't, you judge it to be a thing to do or not. This would not be the method of casuistry. And while it may lead you to stretch a point on the circumference, it will not permit you to destroy the center. It may lead you to stretch a point on the circumference, but it will not permit you to destroy the center. Her argument is that modern moral philosophers lack the philosophic equipment to deal with borderline cases. The problem, she reiterates, is that in a world which lacks an account of virtue and of human flourishing, the foundation, the groundwork, is missing. In modern moral philosophy, she refers to a concrete dilemma of such type often presented by philosophers of her time in Cambridge. The key for her is that these boundary cases, invented by her colleagues in discussion and much debated, assume that only two courses of action are possible. Compliance or open def defiance. She elaborated on this type of dilemma in a discussion with students at an Oxford University philosophy summer school. It is notable that Anscombe does not invent a case for discussion, as philosophers tended to do, and she criticised them for it. Instead, she cites a dilemma from real life, 
and is recalled by Rosalind Hursthaus, a who was mentored by Anscombe. And it goes as follows. An old woman in Austria, under Nazi rule, had given shelter to some Jews in her attic. And one evening, there was the dreaded knock on the door. And a young SS officer saying, we believe you have some Jews here. Clearly, said Anscombe, she must not lie. And there was an embarrassed silence, because we all thought that obviously she must, that this was the morally right thing to do. But we did not dare to say so. And Anscombe left the pause continue. And then she said, of course, she mustn't tell the truth either. And we were all greatly relieved, but also puzzled. And Hursthaus goes on. Anscombe went on to describe what the woman had in fact done. She had turned on a brilliant performance of pretending to believe that the young officer was her sister's son, whom she had not seen since he was a boy. Gustav, she cried, how wonderful, come in, come in. How is dear Lotte? I haven't heard from her in so long. I never knew you had become an officer. How tall you have grown. And she kissed him and babbled on, never once telling a lie, and insisted that he have coffee and cakes. And being young and well-mannered, he was too embarrassed to tell her that she had made a mistake and press his official question. So he partook of the coffee and cakes and escaped as soon as he could. She must not lie, and of course, she mustn't tell the truth either. Anscombe claims that we cannot assume that only two courses of action are open in a presented forced choice between evils. It is essential to look for a third possibility. Rather than asking what is the morally right thing to do here, one can prompt a different answer by posing the question differently. It is practical wisdom, that is to say Aquinas' exercise of the virtue of prudentia, that enables a person to stretch a point on the circumference when faced with borderline cases, with conflict situations, with dilemmas. Getting the question right is key. We should not ask for Anscombe what is the morally right thing to do. Rather, she says, ask what would a virtuous person, a just person, a charitable, charitable person do faced with this situation? And this is one of the questions that Anscombe opened for philosophical debate. Central to this debate is the role of practical wisdom, right practical action, prudentia, in good human living. Elizabeth Anscombe initiated a retrieval of an Aristotelian account of virtue ethics. At the center of this is an account of good human action, the decision making that leads to action. While Aristotle is evidently influential, the work of Aquinas, while generally unreferenced for Anscombe, is in the background throughout. And it is interesting to inquire why there is so little explicit reference. Mary Geach, Anscombe's daughter, wrote in 2011 that her mother, and I quote, drew an Aquinas' thought to an unknowable extent. But she said to me that it aroused prejudice in people to tell them that a thought came from him. And sometimes I think not much has changed. So it aroused prejudice in people to tell them that a thought came from him. To my sister she said that to describe or ascribe a thought to Aquinas made people boringly ignore the philosophical interest of it, whether they were for Aquinas or against him. So instead of direct referencing and citation, Anscombe takes up Aquinas' ideas and develops them in her own vocabulary in fresh and profound ways. In this way, we can see that the work of Elizabeth Anscombe builds on Aquinas' understanding of virtue 
and in particular of Prudentia. I must say I was delighted to find the quote by her daughter because when I was reading I could see Aquinas but he was never referenced. I think once there's one footnote reference. So Anscombe's acknowledgement of the illegitimacy of lying, she must not lie, is complemented by the advocacy of prudential truth-telling. Of course, she mustn't tell the truth either. And it is here, I think, that we best see the difference from Bonhoeffer's thinking. Remember, he wrote, if I refuse to incur guilt against the principle of truthfulness for the sake of my friend, if I refuse to tell a robust lie for the sake of my friend. And so to some brief concluding thoughts. This paper began by making reference to contemporary notions such as fake news and a post-truth era. These notions could be taken in different senses. They could be taken as a denial of all truth, and in this sense they are making metaphysical implications. But perhaps more realistically, and even invidiously, they refer to an era, to a time, when truth doesn't really seem to matter and language is instrumentalized. That is to say, it is used as a tool to serve one's aims. Hannah Arendt, as pointed out in the introduction, anticipated this characteristic of the modern political era. And indeed, in a continuation of this paper, I will engage with her analysis. This paper on the complexity of truth-telling indicates that the work of Aquinas can act as a resource for presenting a different vision of human society and human flourishing and human character. His work does not try to bypass the unjust relationships that deliberate mendacity entails and yet still acknowledges the complexity of truth-telling. As he shows, the exercise of the virtue of prudentia is the linchpin of all virtuous actions. The work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Elizabeth Anscombe has been used to bring this discussion of truth-telling to bear on concrete situations coloured by recent history. Bonhoeffer insists that truth-telling has to be learnt, acknowledging that finding this word, the truthful word, is a matter of long, earnest and ever more advanced effort on the basis of experience and knowledge of the real. Anscombe's insistence is that we should ask not what is the morally right thing to do, rather ask what would a virtuous, a just, a charitable person do when faced with this situation. The argument of this paper is that these resources within the Western philosophical and theological tradition need to be recovered and effectively communicated in our current horizon. For the world we live in is crying out for thoughts such as this. Thank you very much.